So like McGrath, today's guest speaker is a luminary, though perhaps one of a different kind. Our own Smith alumni quarterly referred to her devoted fans as word nerds, among whom Corey Stamper is a rock star. <laughs> To be sure, Corey, you are among friends, and not just because you are an alum of Smith College. Yay, class of 96. <laughs> but also because I imagine that most of us in this room easily qualify ourselves as word nerds. Um, perhaps even uber um, fervid, zealous, rhapsodic, exuberant, spirited word nerds. <laughs> Corey has been a lexico <laughs> I knew I'd do it. lexicographer at Merriam-Webster since 1998, and while sorting fact from fiction for the dictionary, she helped launch the Ask the Editor series, and of course, most recently, and part of the reason we're here tonight, was able to complete this wonderful book, Word by Word, The Secret Life of Dictionaries. Congratulations on the publication and its success. As noted on her blog, um, Publishers Weekly called this book a witty, sly, occasionally profane, behind-the-scenes tour aimed at deposing the notion of real and proper English, here, here. Uh, if that is not a winning endorsement of a book, I'm really not sure what is. Um, Corey's blog, Harmless Drudgery, the defining the words that define us, is also at turns witty, sly, and downright funny. Corey's treatment of our very human, which to me means flawed, uh, engagement with language is refreshingly honest and always delivered with a written wink and a nod that I personally find hard to click away from. You can read more of her work and a lot more about her, especially as she's been engaged in this book tour on Mental Floss, The New York Times, Tribune, The Guardian, Slate, Entertainment Weekly, NPR, among many others. Um, if that doesn't sate you, you can also find her on YouTube. So check her out. So if you spend two minutes listening to Corey or reading her work, you will know without a doubt that she is someone who deeply and passionately loves words. Now for most of us, I think that's a pretty common affinity. Who doesn't enjoy a good debate with friends over dinner about a particular turn of phrase or the correct usage of this or that or, or perhaps the incorrect usage of this or that? Um, I think, too, there are probably many people in this room familiar with the exquisite pain and sincere desperation that comes with trying to find that exact word, whether it's written or spoken, and sometimes we succeed and sometimes maybe less so. All of this struggle, both fun and laborious, I hope, is in our drive to be sincere, truthful, find common ground and understanding, and maybe above all, just make sure that we can explain ourselves clearly. So we love words, and that's why we're here. But this evening, Corey will speak to her own experience with the wacky, wonderful world of vocabulary and meaning in a journey that has been uniquely all her own. So please help me welcome Corey Stamper. Hello, everyone. Wow, there we go. We're going to go back there. Are we there? We're there. Um, I am so delighted to be back on campus for the McGrath Lecture. It is a real, it's a real honor to be here. And I do want to give you a taste of what my journey has been like. Uh, because one of the questions I always get is, oh my gosh, how do you get a job writing dictionaries? So we'll go all the way back to the beginning. I was an early and voracious reader, which meant that in my particular high school, I was a capital N nerd. <laughs> uh, as proof, this is me on the left at my 12th birthday, freaking out because I've been given my very own thesaurus. <laughs> <laughs> so books were my escape mechanism. They were where I went to be who I was. But they also provided fabulous ammunition in the teenage war of survival. See, I was never going to be popular. I was certainly never going to be athletic. I was never going to throw the best parties or throw any parties at all. But what I was going to do is I was going to have the best comebacks ever. <laughs> and so I did. I delved into my Roger's thesaurus that I was freaking out about. And I started collecting words. So posturing football players would harass me in the hall, and I would answer with troglodyte <laughs> or cacafuego. 
I mean, why settle for stupid brown noser when you could use pathetic lick spittling ass instead? <laughs> And it worked, by the way, in 12th grade, I was voted most sarcastic in my class. <laughs> so words comfort, comforted me, they buttressed me, but when I got to Smith, I was a Smithy through and through. I went the pragmatic route. Because I was also a first-gen college student from a relatively poor blue-collar background. And so, because I got to go to Smith, that meant I was going to be a doctor. And that lasted all of a year until I was defeated by my nemesis, organic chemistry. So I came into my second year just rudderless. I was at a loss as to what to do with myself. So on a whim, I took a 100-level colloquium on the medieval Icelandic family saga was taught by Craig Davis, who is not here today, which is sad. I was really hoping to embarrass him deeply, but <laughs> we'll have to embarrass him vicariously. So the medieval Icelandic family sagas, they are heavily fictionalized accounts of the medieval settlement of Iceland, and they are amazing. They are like daytime soap operas written by Ingmar Bergman. They're full of divorce and murder and sadness, and there's also zombies in them. But the thing that really grabbed me was the language of them. So one of the very first sagas that we read had a main character whose name was this. <laughs> okay, most of the students looked at that unfortunate jumble of letters and we thought, well, this is pronounced Harafunkel or Raffenkel or something like that. And uh, Craig said, no, 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 this is Old Norse, and Old Norse has a completely different pronunciation convention than English, and the way that this is pronounced is, and then he said a word that you can't actually transcribe using any of the 26 letters that we have in the alphabet. So that first part, the H-R-A-F, is this rough, rolled hrap, like you've stopped a sprinter and you've asked them to say crap while they're clearing their throat. <laughs> That N is just a little swallowed hum to get you ready for the big finish, which is the K-E-L-L. -L. Now, imagine the sound that a kid in a commercial would make if you give them a plate of steamed broccoli instead of whatever, Choco Crunch Bomb cereal. They would say, blech. <laughs> so you swap out the blech for a k, and that's what you have. Smash it together, and you have hramkesh. Okay, that last sound, that that was giving the class fits. So we were all trying it. Yeah. And Craig would say, no, 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 try it again. You do this with your tongue, do that with your mouth. And one of the women in the class complained, I'm spitting all over myself. And Craig brightened and said, yeah, you've got it. That's how you do it. So while the class slobbered all over themselves, Professor Davis explained that this sound, this sound that the double L makes is called the voiceless alveolar lateral fricative. And I totally lost it. <laughs> I blurred it out in class, what? And so he repeated it, voiceless alveolar lateral fricative. He went on to say that it was used in Welsh, but I was lost to that explanation. Voiceless alveolar lateral fricative. <laughs> Voiceless, this is a sound that you make, that you give voice to, that is called voiceless. Lateral, that was the trick none of us could get. You spit it out of the side of your mouth like <laughs> chewing tobacco. <laughs> and fricative, I had no idea what that meant, but that sounded gorgeously obscene. <laughs> so I approached Professor Davis after class and I said, hi, you don't know me. I want, I want to major in this, the weird sound and all of that. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I'm the chair of the medieval studies department. Why don't you take old English next semester? That'll give you a sense as to what this is about. So I did. Old English is the great granddaddy of modern English. It was spoken around 600 AD until about 12, 1300 AD. It was not what Shakespeare used. That's modern English, but you're all Smithies. You know that already. So you can see it looks kind of like, you know, drunk sideways German with extra letters thrown in. It does not look at all like English. But once you start saying it, 
and compare it to the translation, it makes sense. So, he is his brother is he is his brother. That was mein wief, that was my wife. This life is short, this life is short. Hui singeth this man. Why is that man singing? <laughs> so the last sentence in that translation exercise that we did really bothered me. Because the other three matched up syntactically really well. And this one didn't. So after class, I actually asked Craig why that is. And he said, well, this is kind of a more colloquial translation. If you really want to go word for word, it would be, why singeth this man? And I thought, huh. And then the language centers of my brain lit up like a used car lot. Because I was familiar with singeth, right? I thought it was some very fancy 17th century poetic way of saying sings. This is how, you know, Blake and Alexander Pope fit scansion together. But no, see, singeth, this thing I assumed was a very fancy adaptation, was actually the original third person inflection of sing. In fact, English used singeth longer than it used sings. So this absolutely blew my mind. <laughs> because I knew that some language forms fell out of use, and I kind of knew that there were always new words encroaching on the language. But the idea that you could watch language change by looking at the written record completely turned my world upside down. So from that point on, I was a woman obsessed. I traced words across the rough sword and buckler of Old English, through the sibilant seesaw of Middle English, through the fart jokes of Shakespeare. I picked and I chipped at words like supercilious until I found the cool, slow-voweled Latin underneath of it. I discovered in all of this research that nice used to mean lewd, and that before we ate stew for dinner, we would go to stews after dinner. Stew used to mean whorehouse. So I didn't just fall down the rabbit hole, I saw the rabbit hole in the distance and I threw myself into it. The more I learned about English, the more I absolutely fell in love with this wild, vibrant horror of a language. Now that doesn't immediately translate to a job path, though. <laughs> I mean, you love words, so what are you going to do? You're going to either teach and starve, or you're going to go into publishing and starve. So my first job out of college was actually here at Smith College. I was the administrative assistant for one of the graduate schools. And I was in development, and I died a very slow death, because numbers and I don't get along at all. But if Smithies are one thing, it is very persistent. So I kept scouring newspaper ads, and in May of 1998, I found one. A reference publisher in Springfield, Massachusetts, was hiring an editorial assistant. Now, it didn't say who the publisher was. I didn't really know what that meant. I thought, well, an editorial assistant and a reference publisher. So are you reading the slush pile for textbooks? What does that mean? But it was in publishing. It was in Springfield. I didn't have to move to New York. Fine. I applied. I was invited in for an interview, and it was only during the interview that I found out where I would be working, the dictionary, and what I would be doing as an editorial assistant, which is writing the dictionary. I was told this by Steve Peralt, who was the director of defining, and still is, at Merriam-Webster. He was the one giving me my interview. He's a very tall, quiet, imposing man. The entire office is all sort of quiet and imposing. <laughs> When I finally sat across from Steve in the editorial conference room for my interview, I gave him a very heavily abridged version of my collegiate experience. And he just sat and listened while I just blithered at him. And really, really aware of the fact that for the first time, perhaps in my adult life, I really, really wanted this job. And I was really, really talking way too much. <laughs> So I stopped, and I thought, if I stop and I catch my breath, maybe something really smart will come to me. And all that came to me was the truth. So I said, I just love English. I just really, really love the English language. 
And Steve took a deep breath and he said, well, there are few who have your enthusiasm for it. <laughs> I started as an editorial assistant at Merriam-Webster three weeks later. Now, the thing about being at the dictionary is you realize very quickly that very few people give any thought at all to the dictionary that they use. In fact, if they give any thought to the dictionary at all, it's that the dictionary is just that. It is the dictionary. Instead of a dictionary or one of several dictionaries, that red Webster's that you have in your desk drawer is just one of a ton of Webster's dictionaries. They're all published by different publishers. And I thought the same thing. So if I thought so little about dictionaries, then I gave lexicography itself bugger all. But the thing I did know about dictionaries is that dictionaries are supposed to be the thing that defines the English language. They set boundaries around the English language. And I thought, that's a good thing. I'm happy to work for the guardian of the English language. It's like a big linguistic house mother setting curfew. <laughs> this view of the language is actually called prescriptivism. Now, there's another view of the language. If there's prescriptivism on one side, then what's on the other? That is descriptivism, which is this idea that all language is valid and all language is worth being studied. And you know, I mean, it's oh, okay, that's fine and all, but I felt like, you know, if, we're, if I'm gonna be on this spectrum of prescriptivism and descriptivism, I mean, the dictionary, it's pretty prescriptive. Well, no, the dictionary is actually incredibly descriptive. <laughs> the thing is that the job of a dictionary, as I learned, is as Noah Webster, who was America's first commercially successful lexicographer. The way he put it was that we are to collect, define, and arrange as far as possible all the words that belong to a language. I learned very quickly that we are actually just observers of the language, not guardians of the language, and it's our job just to describe as accurately as possible as much as we can. Now, there are way more words in the world than there are lexicographers, so we fudge Noah's all words a little bit. For most professionally edited dictionaries, a word needs to meet three separate criteria for entry. First is widespread use, printed use particularly. It needs to be used not just geographically in as many places as possible, but also tonally in as many places as possible. If a word is used in both the Wall Street Journal and Vibe, it has a much better chance of getting into a general dictionary than if the word is used a million times and only in Bon Appetit and Wine Spectator. <laughs> so widespread use is the first criterion. The second one is sustained printed use. Now, most people assume that when a word shows up in print for the first time, which incidentally is not the first time that a word is created, it's just the first time that someone has written it down, they think it's this pretty straight graph up. It's used in print and then all the people use it. That's not actually how it usually works. Often a word will come into print and it will have very, very, very little use for a very, very, very long time until there's something that propels it up into our general consciousness. The word korma, which refers to an Indian dish, is a great example of this. It got into the dictionary maybe just 10 years ago, but it was first used in print in the 1830s. Or sometimes a word comes in and everybody uses it all the time, and then it drops out of use for a dozen years. And then maybe someone rediscovers it because that's how fashion works, right? The 80s are back, I hear. So then it gets used again, and then it drops out of use. Lexicographers want to see that hill and valley sort of flatten out a little bit. We want to make sure that the word is actually going to stick around, that it'll be a word that people look up. So we have widespread use, sustained use, and then meaningful use. A word has to have a meaning, and that's ridiculous, because all words have meaning. Except words like anti-disestablishmentarianism, which is not a word that gets used in print much, but when it gets used in print, it's an example of a long word. Now that doesn't mean long word. No one would say, uh, he filled his OkCupid okay profile with anti-disestablishmentarianisms to impress dates. No one would say that. 
unless he was really into like post-reformational Scottish Christianity. But <laughs> so in that sense, anti-disestablishmentarianism isn't a word that I can define. It's just a word that's used as an example of something. Now, if a word meets these three criteria, that means it's eligible to be entered into a dictionary. Well, that's great, but I mean, what about all of the words that we know are bad and stupid and wrong, right? Because there are wrong words in this world. I mean, we are educated people, and we know there are wrong words. <laughs> well, the thing that's interesting about descriptivism and prescriptivism is that they've been shoehorned into this weird moral dualism, and what that means is that language is given a moral charge that it doesn't inherently have. So prescriptivism champions the best practices of English. That's what they say. And if you're championing the best practices, well, I mean, the best of anything is going to be certainly right. And if it's right, then it's probably going to be good, right? I mean, wouldn't you want good writing? Wouldn't you want the best writing? And if that's what prescriptivism is, then descriptivism, on the other end of the spectrum, must be really bad. So in a letter to his publisher, E.B. White, who uh, wrote Charlotte's Web, but also is the second half of Strunk and White, they put out a best-selling uh, writer's guide, The Elements of Style, he beautifully expresses the view of prescriptivists towards descriptivists in a letter to his publisher. He writes, I've been sympathetic all along with your qualms about the element of style, but I know that I cannot and will shall not attempt to adjust to the unadjustable Mr. Strunk, to the modern liberal of the English department, the anything goes fellow. <laughs> I guess E.B. White didn't believe that women could be in modern English departments. Your letter expresses contempt for this fellow, but on the other hand, you seem to want his vote. I'm against him, temperamentally, and because I've seen the work of his disciples, and I say, the hell with them. <laughs> now, where does this come from? Why do we suddenly give language this weird moral charge? A lot of it is how we have been taught to perceive of language. What we do is we collect bricks of information, and we build them into a tower, some big linguistic tower. And this is the tower through which we defend ourselves. So when people accuse us of being uneducated, we can say, no, 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 because I know how to use affect and effect. See, it's right here. Or if people come at us and, and they're deriding us for something that we say, we can whip out our qualifications. It's a defensive mechanism. And the reason that we need a defensive mechanism is because we like to be the smartest people in the room. <laughs> No one wants to be the moron. <laughs> Prescriptivism is not just an approach to language. It's been imbued with this moral and mystical quality. So prescriptivists approach the dictionary and think, as I did when I started working here, that if a word is in the dictionary, then it's official. It's real. It's part of sanctioned proper English. You can hear all the capitalization there when people say it. They believe that prescriptivism is good, and that the dictionary, if it's prescriptivist, is also good. They want to make sure that all the bad, illogical, ugly, stupid, uneducated, uncouth words don't make it in. And if prescriptivism is good, then a descriptivist approach to the dictionary must therefore be evil. Because it doesn't present any standards or rules. Don't we all need standards? Everyone needs boundaries. The problem, again, is that dictionaries are entirely descriptive. And the thing is that as a lexicographer, it doesn't matter what your personal view of language is. It doesn't matter if you, like I was, came in and you were the biggest grammar snob in the world. Your job as a lexicographer is to be a descriptivist. The reality is that dictionaries do not just enter good words. They enter bad and ugly words, too. And they do that because you'd be surprised at how many bad and ugly and wrong words end up making it into written, edited prose on a regular basis. Now, 
One of the jobs of a Merriam-Webster editor is to answer user correspondence. <laughs> and very early on in my tenure as a lexicographer, I got an email from someone who was absolutely ripshit furious that we entered irregardless into our online dictionary. It is a horrible, horrible word. And I got the email and I just rolled my eyes because obviously irregardless isn't a real word. So it's not in our online dictionary, dude. So I started crafting my reply to him, basically saying that it's not in our dictionary. You just went to any old crap online dictionary. <laughs> And so I began saying, you know, if you look up a word in our online dictionary and it's not there, you'll be taken to this page. And I couldn't remember what the wording on the page was. So I opened up my web browser and I typed in irregardless. And then we have an entry for irregardless in the <laughs> online dictionary. I lost it. I was so surprised and upset and embarrassed for us that I actually said, ah. see, even the projector doesn't like it regardless. I was so upset that I actually said out loud, really loudly in my cubicle in the middle of the workday, are you shitting me? <laughs> the spectrum of hatred against irregardless is unmatched. Everyone says they hate the word moist. Ew, moist is gross. But if you say irregardless to people, they are vehement and angry and furious in your general direction. And the reasons that they'll give you for irregardless being a terrible word are many, many, many. It's not actually a word. It's an illogical coinage. It's redundant. It's uneducated. All of these complaints point to one thing, and that is, Irregardless is evidence that English is going to hell in a handbasket, and you, Merriam-Webster, are the ones skipping down the path holding it. <laughs> I mean, the truth is, is obviously I felt for this complainant because I knew deep down at a molecular level that irregardless was wrong, and nothing was going to convince me otherwise. But you know, sharing my personal linguistic beef with the world is not part of the job. So I buttoned my yap and I responded. I said, yes, I know it's entered. I too am shocked. <laughs> but we do note, please, label it as non-standard, which means that it's not a part of standard formal English. And we have, after the one word definition, this really long usage paragraph that ends even for commie, liberal, pinko, hippie descriptivists like us with a pretty prescriptive statement, use regardless instead. I sent it off and I thought, well, that was done. Yeah, well, that's not done because this is actually a common complaint that gets sent to dictionary companies, which meant that I had to answer all of these questions about irregardless constantly even though I hate the word with every fiber of my being. I regret to inform that irregardless meets all of the criteria for a word. Yes, irregardless is redundant, but redundancy in English vocabulary is commonplace, and if we are to get rid of redundant words, we're going to set fire to half the language. You are correct that irregardless is an illogical coinage, but so is unthaw to mean thaw, and yet no one is burning dictionaries in the streets over unthaw. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to write. <laughs> I answered these complaints for years, and I came to this sort of uneasy accord. I basically said, OK, I looked at the evidence. Yes, irregardless has been used in written, edited prose for a sustained period of time, and it has a meaning. Fine, it merits entry. But I was never going to like irregardless, and I was never going to think it was a good word, and I was still going to hold to the opinion that people who used it were really sloppy at best. And then in about 2003, I was the managing editor for the email, and I got this email. To whom it may concern, as any educated Mississippian knows, <laughs> irregardless is the superlative form of regardless, not used in lieu of, as is stated by y'all. Regards. <laughs> Now, see, 
I was now the managing editor of the email, which meant that I did not have to answer this. And there was no way in hell I was going to answer this. <laughs> because to answer it, that would mean I would have to investigate. And to investigate means that I would have to give this educated Mississippian some credence that irregardless is what he calls superlative, but what we would call an emphatic use of regardless. And I wasn't going to do that because I had been here long enough to know that the minute that you start looking at the evidence, you're going to find something that tells you that you are deeply unswervingly wrong about a word that you still feel is bogus. So even though I knew in my heart that this is not how English worked, I wanted irregardless to be ugly and morally wrong so that I could be smart and morally right. Well, I also was not going to voice this off on some poor editor below me. So I got out of my chair and I started looking at the written evidence that we had for irregardless in our files. And almost immediately, I ran across this from Alice Walker. I remembered the magnitude of his problems, problems I was just beginning to truly understand. As a black man, as an, as an artist, growing up poor, forced to endure the racist terrorism of the American South, he was unlucky in love and no prince of a parent, irregardless, as the old people said, and as Mr. Sweet himself liked to say, not only had he lived to a ripe old age, but he had continued to share all his troubles and his insights with anyone who would listen. Now, there's something that's peculiar about this particular use of irregardless. And this is the sort of thing that lexicographers are actually trained to see. First, the piece of paper itself was stamped rejected. Now, for every piece of evidence that we use to support an entry in the dictionary as evidence that this is what the word means, you stamp it as accepted. If it's rejected, that means it's not covered by the dictionary entry. It means that the senior editor who worked on irregardless for the last dictionary update felt that this irregardless did not just mean regardless. And the other peculiar thing is the emphasis that it's given in the text. It's italicized. You can almost hear the emphasis. It's a very verbal thing, irregardless. You can hear the wave of the hand with it. So maybe my educated Mississippian was on to something. So I went spelunking, because that's what lexicographers do. Now, the written evidence of irregardless goes back to the 1700s, and I found evidence of this particular emphatic irregardless all the way back to the early 1800s. It shows up, here's the thing, completely unremarkably in its earliest uses. There's nothing in any of the earliest bits of written evidence we have for irregardless that would hint that this is the worst word in the English language. <laughs> but something interesting happens in the early 1800s, and that is that irregardless starts to be tagged in print as evidence of uneducated use. So here's a really good example from the 1800s. This is from an op-ed, or what we would now call an op-ed, what they called news in the 1800s about a teacher who gave a report for the Jefferson Township. This is in Indiana, by the way. And in this long report, the teacher says, keep the scholars in regular years work, irregardless of their desire, is my best judgment. And of course, the op-ed writer decides to skewer this teacher as being an idiot by saying, the trustee suggests that it would probably be inuseless to suggest anything for these unrestless scholars who are so irregardless of their conduct. <laughs> now, the weird thing is, why is there all of this bizarre dislike suddenly for irregardless? Well, the answer is that irregardless began its life as a dialect term. Now, dialects are like these little subsets of a language. We usually think of them as regional, right? So there's New England English, there's Southern English, there's the thing they speak in Boston, there's whatever Texans do. But really, dialects can be divided up and sliced up a whole bunch of different ways. They can be divided and sliced by race, socioeconomic status, they can be divided up by age, they can be divided up even by industry. 
And the thing is that dialects are sort of all over the place. We live and move and have our being within them. Standard English is one of many dialects. Now, irregardless began life as a dialect term in the upper Midwest, and it was spoken mostly by rural speakers, small town folk, country folk. Around the 1800s, just like society began urbanizing, so too did our language. So as people moved into the cities, the speech of city dwellers was heralded as being sophisticated, and then more educated, and then best, and then good. In short order, I became America's foremost irregardless apologist. <laughs> I did a short video for Merriam-Webster's website on how irregardless is, in fact, a word. I took to social media. I booed naysayers who said irregardless was signs of the demise of English. And I continued to look and find evidence of the emphatic irregardless all over the place, because one of the great things we have now is transcribed speech. I found irregardless used in national news broadcasts on NPR in all sorts of sports, you know, color commentary. In fact, I found evidence of the emphatic irregardless in oral arguments for a Supreme Court case. And those lawyers are fairly well educated. So, you know, of course, I got hate mail because that's my job, I get hate mail. <laughs> One person said, it's a made-up word that made it into the dictionary through constant use. And this was a complaint, and I cackled before responding because, of course, it's a made-up word that got into the dictionary through constant use. That's how this dictionary racket works, actually. <laughs> also, do you think there are some words that aren't made up? All words are made up. We don't, like, mine for them in whales or something. <laughs> I began telling correspondents who complained, look, you don't have to like it regardless, you don't have to use it regardless, but it's a lot more complex than you think, and it deserves a little bit of respect, even if it's not part of standard English. My mother was duly horrified. In fact, she said, so much for that Smith education. <laughs> The whole point, though, underscores that initial exuberant love that I had for the language. Remember that we think of English as our fortress that we build up. It's a fortress that we use to defend, and it's also something that we need to defend. But I think it's a little bit easier to think of English as a child. It's something that we love and we nurture into being. And as soon as it gains gross motor skills, it goes exactly where you do not want it to go. It heads right for the goddamn electrical sockets. You dress it in fancy clothes, you send it out to play, you tell it to behave, it comes home covered in mud, it's got its underwear on its head. We ask it to be just a little bit more respectful and respectable, just clean yourself up a little bit, and it hollers that we're ruining its life, man, and it you know, goes and listens to the Smiths in the dark. <laughs> what we have historically done is we sit English down in a chair and we tell it everything that we have done to and for you, we do so that you will be respected, so that you will be understood as being high class and educated. And you know, it slouches in its chair and it writes irregardless all over itself in ballpoint pen. And we get mad that English isn't listening to us. Why aren't you listening to me? But if you think of English like a child, then you also understand that well-adjusted children grow up and they live their own life apart from their parents. And that's the thing that's beautiful about English throughout its entire history. It has lived its own life. All attempts to shape it, to control it, to say certain parts of it are good and certain parts of it are bad have not actually done away with any of the bad parts or made any of the good parts better. We can tell English to clean itself up and look like Latin or French, but the fact is, is if it did, it wouldn't be English. And if, it, if we do that, then we're not actually honoring what English is. Samuel Johnson calls it a wild, barbarous jargon. And I love that. 
because it is wild and barbarous. It is not something that is only for the educated. It is not something that is only for old white men or old white women or English is for everybody. And if you accept that English can exist, that good best practices can exist next to irregardless, then you'll understand why English is so beautiful and why it continues to flourish. Thank you. We have time for some questions? All right. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Um, when um, research, is there any um, comment um, besides irregardless where you really just fell down the rabbit hole and <laughs> came out knowing something about a word that you would have never expected? Oh, yeah. Just about every day at my job, I feel like that. Um, one of my, <laughs> I, I actually find a lot of things, proofreading the dictionary, this is another sign that I'm a giant nerd, right? But I get paid to proofread the dictionary. We have some correspondents who do it for free because they're crazy. Um, one of my favorite words I found while proofreading, um, and this is sort of my standard favorite word answer, is there's this word, guardy Lou. It's an interjection, and uh, its definition is, if I remember it right, used as a warning cry formerly in Edinburgh when throwing slops out the upper stories. <laughs> right? And so I was like, I, what, huh? So at lunch I was like, well, I want to see what Gardy Lou is. And I discovered that Gardy Lou actually has a ton of printed use from the 1800s. They think it's from the French Gardy Lou, which tells you something about Scotland at that time, that it was under French rule. Lots of people don't know that unless they study Scottish history. So I, I do, I feel like I fall down the rabbit hole almost every day at work. Even if it's a rabbit hole, I don't want to go down. Like, there have been times when I've had to define words I don't actually like. I'm not allowed professionally to dislike words, but personally, you know, the heart wants what it wants, and <laughs> the heart really hates impactful, for instance. So <laughs> and there have been times when I've had to define impactful, so then I have to sit all day with a word that I hate. But you learn something about that. I mean, I feel like the more you spend looking and researching English, the more respect you have to have for it. Or you just give up and you learn German. Like, that's how you do it. Yeah, in the back. Uh, you've talked about how you rely a lot on print <laughs> for validation of usage. As we move out of the era of print, and even you know, uh, digitizing your, into print-like substances, uh, a lot of this is becoming more and more ephemeral. Can you talk about where you see the dictionary process going over the next decade, two decades, you know, or in my case, you know, where will my grandchildren be looking for stuff and how will that get validated should they get a job at Merriam-Webster? Right. So, yeah, should they get a job at Merriam-Webster? It's, so here's the interesting thing. As language has moved online, I mean, our job as lexicographers is to follow the language, so we've followed language online. Um, we do use a lot of print, but now we are looking at print in a different way. So we use print, we read blogs, we read Twitter. It's, you know, some people think that's a horrible thing. Twitter's actually really great for finding regionalisms because people just talk like they talk on Twitter. So we are moving online, and, and that does present sometimes some really difficult editorial decisions. There have been times when I've been looking at something, you know, I've been reading something, let's say, in the New York Times online, and I'm like, oh, it's a really fascinating use of, you know, the word affect. And I copy it, and I dump it into the database, and two hours later, it's been copy edited and changed to effect. And you go, oh, so... Uh, what does that mean? Does that mean then that he, is that an error? What is that? The reality though is that we even had that problem in print. So John Dryden is a great example of this. John Dryden, uh, 17th century poet, literary critic, you know, really peevy kind of guy, would do things like he would go through when it was time to reprint some of his books and he would decide, oh, you know, I don't like the word wench anymore. I'm going to change every instance of wench to mistress. 
or, you know, I'm really on a Latin kick, and I don't like that I ended a lot of these sentences with prepositions, which you can't do in Latin, so I'm going to change all these sentences so they don't end in prepositions, because I think that's more elegant now. So the thing is, is, is anything that you take in print, or frankly, anything that you transcribe from speech, all, all language is ephemeral, right? Any written system is ephemeral. There's language and there's writing, and we can only track one of them, because language isn't something that I, I mean, maybe I will eavesdrop on some of your conversations tonight, but you know, generally speaking, language is a thing that exists outside of writing. Um, we are looking at stuff online. As more stuff comes online, you know, like I said, we look at transcripts of spoken English. That's great. Um, and my guess is that we're just going to keep wherever English ends up going, we're going to keep going there. So, you know, if in 10 years Google has enabled all of us to have a microchip of the Google Dictionary stuck in our heads, which I hope that never, ever happens. But, you know, we're going to be going wherever technology leads, and lexicography always has. So, Thank you. yes. Do you ever use Urban Dictionary? I do use Urban Dictionary. I have some people who are surprised at that, but Urban Dictionary is actually really, really useful in researching uh, slang, and particularly early attestations of slang, because it's user submitted. So people will do things like um, they'll say. Fire is a great example of this. If you have been on Twitter at all, you will hear people sometimes say that was fire, or they will just respond with a bunch of fire emojis. So that early use of fire, you can trace through to Urban Dictionary. And you can say, oh, this was first used in 2003, way before Twitter started. Um, so I do use Urban Dictionary. It, you do have to be careful with any user-submitted dictionary, not necessarily because people just submit whatever word they make up. like. Joshiosity means hot. Like, eh, that doesn't, it's not a real word, but okay. Part of the problem is that sometimes people don't give definitions. They'll say uh, fire or lit. Lit's a great one. Lit means awesome party man. It's like, that's not a, mm, that's not a definition I can use. Is, that, is, it, is lit referring to the awesome part or the party part or the man part? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> But I think user-submitted dictionaries actually have a place. Um, they serve a different function than a professionally edited dictionary does, but I think they're really valuable for linguistic research. In the back in the red. I use n-grams not so much for etymology. For those of you who don't know n-gram, does anyone here not know what an n-gram is? Okay, n-grams are a tool where basically you can look at a collection of texts and you can search them for particular uh, words or phrases, and it will give you a chart of its, its use frequency-wise within that collection of text. Um, we don't use it so much for etymology, but we do end up using it a lot when it comes time to figure out whether we need to hyphenate, close, or open up a compound word. So for instance, the word website used to, for a bajillion and a half years, be open in the dictionary. It was two words, web and site. And the thing is, is the dictionary traditionally can really only show the most common one of those. But not everyone used web space site. Lots of people would use website, one word. So we can use n-grams to see, OK, more people are using website closed than website open. Um, it's also really helpful in determining things like uh, how quickly has a word come into English or sort of are there holes in our data in terms of, you know, we know that this word has been around for a while, but it seems like when we, our, furli our, furliest, our first and earliest written use that we have in our file, it's, it seems like you just get a hunch that eh, there's probably something earlier and you can use n-grams then to say, oh, actually this is 20 years back, so let's see if it's changed meaning at all. Um, for etymology, it's a little trickier just because of, the, of what n-grams are and the corpus that n-grams draw on, mostly. So, yes? I'm, I think you addressed this a bit in the book, but I was wondering if you could speak more to it. Why we don't have kind of an English 
academy like Academy Francaise that monitors the French language? Like, why why is English different um, than some other languages? Why is English different? Because <laughs> we're just free, man. So there are there are, in case you don't know, um, some of the European languages, uh, French, Spanish, and Italian, all have these groups called academies that sort of issue their official language dictionaries. So the French Academy produces a dictionary and says this is what official French is. So uh, for instance, this is great, the French Academy will say do not, French Academy really does not like American or English words at all, you know, and this goes back really to, you know, 1100 AD. <laughs> so what they'll do is they'll say uh, you cannot use the English borrowing la high tech because we already have a French phrase for that, it's le haute technologie. So you use le haute technologie and not le high tech. Le high tech is lazy and American. They don't say lazy and American, <laughs> but it's kind of implied. <laughs> so what they do is they issue these, these dicta and they say this is what the French language is, this is what Italian is, this is what Spanish is. Um, that doesn't actually work in real life, but that's another story. There was a big push in the 1700s to form an English academy, and it was mostly pushed by these guys who wrote books for this burgeoning middle class. There was a big social shift that happened in the 1600s and 1700s where the aristocracy in Britain, in particular, was losing all of their influence and money, and the merchant class, which had been considered low class, was gaining influence and money. So now you've got these low class pretenders pretending to be upper class, and there were a bunch of guys who decided they were gonna write guides to help this new middle class blend into the upper class. This, by the way, is how uh, usage guides and grammars started. Prior to this, there was no idea of proper English, and proper English was whatever you spoke. So there was a big push by these guys to start an academy, and it really fizzled out because the idea of the academy that they had really focused on, again, this idea of best practices. We're gonna look at the best authors in English, and we're only going to model things on them. But at that point, some of the best authors in English, like Shakespeare, used things that they were like, Ugh. like Shakespeare uses double negatives, Shakespeare gets pronouns mixed up sometimes, Shakespeare you know, uses a bunch of things that by, even by the 1700s were verboten. So the idea of an academy sort of took off, but then it also fizzled because who gets to, I mean, you have, you have Britain, but it was an empire. And at the same time that the, there was this fomenting for the academy, you also have the American Revolution starting up. And so you have lots of a desire to keep English bound, but there was really no state that was gonna push for that. Um, and that's really what you need, is all of these academies are state entities. So you need to be able to say, the crown is going to create an academy. Some of, the, some of the requests for an academy or the proposals for an academy sort of border on farce as well. <laughs> They're kind of like, we, you know, it should be, I think it was Daniel Defoe who said that coining words would be as opprobrious as coining money. <laughs> so like, mm, okay, we wanna keep coining words. So it's pretty, it's kind of complicated, but that's the overview. Yes. I was wondering how you feel about the word another a whole nother oh. <laughs> well, I know how a lot of people in the room feel about whole nother <laughs> so whole nother is dialect um, and it's one of those things that sort of appeared in in print as transcribed speech so there's an interesting uh, there's an interesting thing that happens with a whole nother and that is this idea of a another, right? This, this weird false division of another into a another. Um, this is actually a pretty common thing in English. Um, hangnail was formed that way, got an extra H. Apron was napron, and someone misread napron as, it was a napron, and they misread it as an apron. This is back in the 1400s when spaces didn't appear all the time in manuscripts. 
So the thing is, is that there's always that kind of misapprehension. There's always been that kind of weird division and misapprehension in English. I think with most things, like a whole nother, all of it comes down to context, right? If you're writing a formal letter, if you're writing anything, you're probably not going to write a whole nother. You're not going to put a whole nother in your paper, you know, to whomever, to Doug Patey about, you know, we're going to be talking about 18th century poetry. That's a whole nother thing. <laughs> so, but you know, if you're talking to somebody, it's really common too for people who hate words like a whole nother and things like that to actually use them themselves and they just don't realize they're using them. So this is the thing about lots of people say, I would never, I would never say a whole nother. And then 15 minutes later, they'll say, well, that's a whole nother story. Self-reported usage tends to, instead of telling you what people actually say, they tell you what they think you want to hear or they tell you the thing that they think is smarter. So if I asked you, how do you, how, what do you call the, the little uh, thing that you stick a letter in and you lick and you seal. Most people would say envelope because it sounds very fancy to say envelope. When they might say envelope. Or you might say, do you ever use, um, this was a great one. People for a little while at our office, our um, pronunciation editor would go around and he'd ask people to say words just to get a sense as to who says which is the more common pronunciation? And he did it with envelope, which I said, it's, I say envelope. Nope, I say, and nope, what do I, I don't, I don't know what I say anymore. <laughs> he did it one day with um, F-E-N-G space S-H-U-I. He showed me the card and I said, I don't know how to say this. He said, just say it like you would say it, just like if you're reading aloud. I said, I'm gonna get it wrong. He said, just say it. I said, feng shui? Anyway, <laughs> I wrote it down, I said, okay. It's feng shui, that's how you say that word. But you know, I wanted to make, like, I'm reporting my use of this word, so I'm gonna make it sound as convoluted as possible because the more convoluted it is, the better. So whole nother is, it's dialectal. It has context, it has a context. I would never say that you can't use it. I would say it just depends on where you're going to use it and with whom you're going to use it. Yes, on the floor. Um, I have a question about what, what you, you know, I noticed that a lot of words or changing usages of words seem to be coming from marketing mm -hmm. and it's, it's evil growing propaganda. <laughs> easier to say how I feel about that. Um, so in terms of marketing, I must admit my personal preference is that I find business and marketing jargon stupid. So anytime we have a business meeting with anyone in our business office and they say something like, we can surface that on the website, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Honestly, I mean, that kind, of, that kind of extension of use is standard. That's how that happens. We get lots and lots of words from business jargon that you probably don't realize came from business jargon. Um, impact is one of them. So, so business jargon and marketing jargon, I don't like it, but eh, it's fine. And you handle that kind of thing like you would any other entry. Um, propaganda is <laughs> a different critter altogether. So one of the questions that I've gotten a lot recently is um, what it generally boils down to is are you going to change all the definitions in the dictionary because Trump is misusing all of these words? <laughs> or um, like the definition of terrorist is a great example. Who's, who do we call terrorists? Are you going to enter alt-left? Are you entering alt-right? Are you entering Antifa? Do you say Antifa or Antifa? I don't even know. But so, so words that are particularly used in political spin, that are used sort of propagandistically, 
Something that's really fascinating about the work of lexicography is the way that we're trained is you are taught to read through spin. Um, and so I think in some ways that's part of why the dictionary, you know, our Twitter account, everyone is like, woo, Merriam-Webster leading the resistance. Part of why I think people have found the Twitter account and the dictionary so relevant suddenly is because we don't, we were taught to read through spin. We've always read through spin. Trickle-down economics, who remembers when Reagan started that, right? I mean, we're, we've always been taught to read through euphemistic language, to read through anything that might hint at some kind of twist of the language for a particular purpose. And the thing is, is that we're now in an age where people care a lot about how words are used in a whole new way. And I think on all sorts of levels. I mean, I got into a big argument with a person on book tour about the singular they. <laughs> and, you know, and, and for them, this was a personal issue. They is plural, and you know, we just we went at it. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> but I think in terms of words, words matter. And the reason that words matter is because we want to know that there's an objective meaning that can't just be turned on and off or can't be flipped like that, that doesn't turn on a dime. And so I think people are looking to the dictionary to find out what are the objective meanings of these words. Can a fact be alternative? Can the, what does that even mean? Are you going to change the meaning of fact to fit that? You know, are you going to enter alt left even if that's a if that's a term that was created specifically to tar protesters? How do you handle that? And I think one of the one of the comforts that I certainly have found, you know, in the last couple of years as the election cycle has come up, is knowing that, you know, yeah, like, we are now living in an age where propaganda is real again. I feel like, I, I grew up in the 80s, I feel like this is like the duck and cover nuclear drills that we did before Glasnost and Perestroika, like, everybody get ready, here come the Russians, and, but we're trained to read through that. and. And that's also a skill that I think, particularly on the website, when we, when we do essays or when we do articles that pull some of these terms apart, we try and share. Like, this is how we're reading past the spin. So propaganda has always been there. I feel like we're dealing with it more, much more in a visceral way. But, but we see past it. I'm sorry, we're, we're, I know there's like all these hands up. I'm really sorry, but uh, before we thank Corey for her time, I just want to point out that there are books. Um, if, if you don't have a copy of her new book, they are for sale here, um, and you will be doing book signing. Um, and there's also a reception, um, so to cool off, I hope. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for coming, and thank you.